So what do you got? I've got something here that is more valuable than anything I guarantee you've ever seen in this shop. I have a clump of rupees that were minted in 1702 by the son of the man who built the Taj Mahal. The man's name was Muhayuddin Muhammad Aurangzeb Aramgir, otherwise known as Emperor Aurangzeb. It took you a while to remember that, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> it did. This clump of treasure coin is known as the Taj Mahal treasure because it truly is the only sunken treasure related to the Taj Mahal dynasty. The reason why I'm here today is because um, I had these in an auction here and uh, it did not sell, so I'm coming over to see the guys here and um, uh, hopefully they'll open their wallets. So what can you tell me about these? They were minted in Surat, India. They went to the bottom of the ocean in 1702 and were recovered by Arthur C. Clarke and his dive partner. Didn't he write a few books about it? Yeah, he wrote two books about it. In fact, before he really started writing heavily about science fiction, he was an avid scuba diver. When they discovered it in 1961, Clarke and his dive partner, Mike Wilson, swam over the edge of a reef and hear this shipwreck and all these silver coins were laying out all over the bottom. This is one of the most well-documented treasure discoveries in history. I've read books about this wreck. Ever since I started working in the pond business, I've wanted sunken treasure, and this is the mother load. I mean, I've had a few individual coins come in, but nothing like this. They were minted in Surat, India, and then were headed on to the Orient along the spice route, but they never made it there. They were wrecked in a typhoon and wound up on a shipwreck there, and they sat underwater for that long. The reason why they're in such good shape is because they were laying up against some iron object, most likely a cannon. And the cannon oxidizes faster than the silver does, just like a sink on your boat does. Yeah. So that's why coins aren't touched. The natural electrolysis in the water went through the cannon instead of the silver first, so the silver is perfectly preserved. So how did you come in possession of them? Well, I did a documentary with Arthur C. Clarke in 1993. His family consigned it to me, and we've been trying to sell it. You got paperwork on him, right? Yes, signed by Arthur C. Clarke. Everything he's telling me about this adds up with everything I've read. It's authentic, it's the real thing, and I cannot believe it is sitting in my shop. I know it's worth a fortune, but the question is, what does he consider a fortune? One of the things that still gives me a shiver up my spine is that these coins were minted 30 years before George Washington was born. These were worth a lot of money back in those days because they were silver. The, the coin of the realm for the common folks were copper or bronze. By weight, it's a little over 25 pounds, and at 25 pounds, it averages out to about 750 coins in here. Can I buy it for silver scrap? <laughs> no, no, you can't. <laughs> What makes these so valuable is that they are still in clump form. 99% of treasure coins are always reduced down to individual coins and sold off that way. It's extremely rare to have a treasure collection this large. It's even more rare to have them naturally fused together like this. This is unique, and unique usually cost money. The fact that it's all clumped together now and hasn't been disassembled makes it much more valuable, as I'm sure you understand from some of the things that you yeah, yeah, yeah. here. So how much you want for it? Uh, I'd like to get 700,000 for it. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money because we know the rarity. There were only three of them in the world, now there's only two. Originally, there were three clumps of coins, uh, the one that's here in the U.S., one that's in the Clark family archives, and a third that was in a museum in Colombo, Sri Lanka. But when the uh, 2004 tsunami hit, the sea reclaimed that clump of coins, and they've never found it. So now there's only two of them in the world. I really, really want this. I mean, this thing is truly incredible. But tying up three quarters of a million dollars in one item, it could bankrupt this shop. I'd love to have it. It's a cool item. I mean, I, I would love to have it in my shop, but I'm not going to spend that kind of money. If I buy this off you, mm -hmm. i got to put it in an auction, and it might take five or ten years. Right. Which means my money's tied up for a long time. It's an investment. No, it's a gamble. My biggest problem here is, this guy's already told me it didn't meet reserve at auction. I have to buy this thing at a price where I can sell it quickly and make a profit. All I can do now is make an offer. <sighs> um... I want to give you 200 grand for it. 200? Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, that's, no. I, you know, I can go a little bit more, but it's not going to be much. That's what I could do. I mean, there's some things even too expensive for me. 
I respect that. I gotta, I gotta hold out for more. But uh, hey, thanks very much. Uh, okay. Thanks for your time. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry for your new business. I mean, you just, you just gotta look at it from my perspective, yep. and it's a lot of <laughs> damn money. <laughs> that it is. I knew it was a long shot, and I'm really disappointed I wasn't able to buy the treasure. But at the same time, I'm a little bit relieved, because if I had to tell the old man I shelled out a quarter of a million dollars, he would have kicked my ass. <laughs> Hello. How can I help you? Hey, so I wanted to sell my sealed Halo Combat Evolved today. OK, Halo Combat Evolved, this is pretty cool. Usually when you think of Halo, you think of an angel, but we all know this character was anything but an angel. <laughs> I'm here today to sell my brand new sealed Halo Combat Evolved video game. Halo was one of the games that really revolutionized how people saw first-person shooters. This game is in pristine condition. I always make sure to keep it in my safe at all times. I'm asking 13,000 today for my Halo game. If I make the sale today, I plan on taking my girlfriend on a vacation because she highly deserves it. This is awesome. So Halo Combat Evolved would have been the game released with the Xbox when the Xbox came out in 2001 and the game that really brought first-person shooters into the mainstream and, you know, really what they are today. Exactly. This game was so good, people were willing to go out and buy the Xbox, which was an unproven gaming system at the time, just to play this game. And it became the number one gaming system in American households at one point. And wow. really, it was all due to the first Halo Combat Evolved making the way for Xbox to be successful. It was just really special. I actually remember playing this game. I remember going on a quest on this mission for the Halo. You didn't know what it was, and you're just basically trying to fight off this alien civilization with all kinds of crazy stuff. So did you play Halo? Yeah, I grew up. That was one of the first Xbox games I actually got as a kid as to why I have this sealed version now. This is a game that I actually traded half of my collection for. I always wanted to have a sealed Halo in my collection, so I just had to have it. OK, yeah, you know, video collecting is going crazy right now. And obviously, when we were young, we played these video games because they were fun and they took up our time. Never did we think if we kept it sealed, we could maybe buy a car in the future with this video <laughs> exactly. game. So this is actually a really, really cool game. What are you looking to do with it? I'm looking to sell it. And how much are you looking to get? 13000 OK, um, that's a pretty hefty price, but I have no idea on the value. And especially when you get into sealed stuff like this, um, the value shoots up tremendously depending on the condition of the seal and the packaging underneath it. OK, makes sense. So I really need to have someone come take a look at it before I can make you an offer. Cool, I'd love that. OK, give me a few minutes, and I will get my buddy Dennis down here. All right, sounds good. I have no concerns with the expert coming in today to check out my game because I know it's in excellent, pristine condition, and he'll see so too. Hey, Dennis. What's up, chum? How How's you doing? Going? How's it going? What happened to long hair don't care? I'm 15 again. <laughs> I think I can take you a little more serious, actually, now. Um, but I called you down about Halo Combat Evolved, which I imagine is a game that you need no introduction to. I don't think anyone needs an introduction to Halo. Halo really modernized the first-person shooter, and it was Xbox's flagship series. You know, they launched around 20 games when they came out, but it was all about Halo. I called you down because it's sealed, and I just wanted to know the overall condition of it and what kind of value you could have in the condition that it's in. Sealed Halo is like the holy grail. So yeah, I'd love to take a look at it. Yes, please do. All right. There's a couple things to look for, but the print, the actual variant matters. Since Halo sold so many copies, they kept reissuing different prints. This is the launch version. This is like the first sort of press. So that's good. That's really good. But I'm going to take a look. Um, I'm looking to see what kind of wear might exist under the seal, because as the value of these games go up, people are now either resealing used games or they're straight up counterfeiting the entire thing. Um, and, and the seal type looks pretty good, actually. You got the Y-fold seams on the sides. So it's definitely a legit copy in that this isn't a counterfeit. However, this security seal is not period correct. And, and it's a legitimate barcode, but what people are doing is they're, they're finding old stock of these barcodes and applying them and resealing these games. It's a really damn good reseal, too, at that. So I'm guessing that affects the value tremendously. Yeah. What are we talking? Any value? I mean, you know, if this were legit, they've sold up to over 25 grand, depending on condition. 
but this is basically just a complete in box copy and you only got like 25 bucks. I'd have to say, ever since you cut your hair, you've only brought me bad news. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to bring some good news next time. All right, thank you, Dennis. Hey, good thank luck. You. Thanks. All right, well, unfortunately, this is a resale. I believe Dennis, he's trained to spot little errors like this, so um, sorry, man. I hope it didn't hurt too bad. That's all good, it happens. Thank you for your time. Uh, have a good day. So it does kind of suck that I wasn't able to make the deal today, but you know, that just goes to show I gotta be a little bit more careful in my deals that I make. What do we got here? Hi. We have a guitar. Obviously. <laughs> yes, it is a DJ Ashbur guitar. Owned by DJ Ashbur? I think so. I mean, it's got his name over here, so I hope so. You know what? He's a rock star. <laughs> yeah. Which I really wanted to be a rock star at one point, but I didn't have the hair. It's okay, you can borrow some of mine. <laughs> I'm here looking to sell this guitar that was apparently owned by DJ Ashbrook. It's a Gibson guitar with a lot of custom details on it. I got the guitar because my boyfriend is building a children's hospital here in Las Vegas, which is super exciting, and we've been collecting items to sell to help donate to the cause. I'm hoping to get 5,000 for the guitar. I'm kind of impressed, DJ Ashbrook. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who are kind of rock stars, but he really is a rock star. 6 a.m., Guns N' Roses, uh, Grammy nominations. Pretty cool. So do you know anything about the history of it or anything like that? I don't. I'm a GNR fan, but that's about it. People have been giving me items because we're trying to raise money for the Children's Hospital here in Vegas. OK, I get it. And no paperwork, no backstory, nothing? Nothing, but like I said, I'm hoping we can get a lot of money for it. OK, well, I can tell you right away, this is something from Gibson's custom shop. Uh, this is not how they normally build a Les Paul. So, I mean, it's it's a custom. The paint scheme is definitely different. There's usually like four knobs. You have more switches. It's just everything's laid out different than a normal Les Paul. I mean, it's in great shape. It's obviously been played. And you think it might have been his? It could be. I mean, that's why it's, I'm hoping that's why it has his name on it. How much you want for it? At least five grand. OK. Um, there's a lot of variable factors, OK? OK. Um, OK, it's a Les Paul, so I mean, it's a lot of money. You know, this isn't one you buy off the shelf. I mean, was this a limited edition model they put out? Was this actually for DJ Ash? But if this is really his, it could be worth something, OK? okay great. Um, so, and I know a guy who will know all those. Amazing. Give me five minutes, I'll go give him a call. All right, sounds great. Thank you. There hey, he man. is. How are you? Hey, brother, how's it going? Been great. How have you been? Hi, Hi. how are you? Hi, nice to meet I'm you. I'm DJ. Nice yeah, to meet you. So if anybody's going to know about the guitar, it's this guy. What do, you, so, yeah. what do you guys have? I am so excited to see which guitar it could be, and I'm praying to God it's the one I'm hoping, because I lost one years ago that meant the world to me. Hopefully it's it. Do you recognize this? Was this like a limited edition, or? I could recognize this guitar a mile away. This right here is the holy grail. It's amazing. There's only one of these made in the world. It's crazy, Rick. This thing went missing years ago, and I always wondered what happened to it. This was the prototype, and then once we locked in on this design, Gibson only made 100 of them. I actually played it on some of the records on 6 AM, and a lot with Guns N' Roses. This is really cool. So you played this one on stage and everything else like that? Yeah, I abused it. <laughs> <laughs> There's even still probably beer stains and stuff on it. <laughs> the weird thing when I joined Guns N' Roses is playing a Les Paul. Obviously, it's the right guitar for the sound of the band. But I could never get used to the two volume knobs, so I had them take one off. Uh, so there's only one volume, two tones, and I put a kill switch in here and moved the three-way down here because it just felt more comfortable to me. OK. So That's this, awesome. this is the real deal. And it's funny because they put my name on it, but it's upside down. They printed it upside down, which is kind of funny. <laughs> OK. Do you want it back? It's a really special guitar. I would love to have it back. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get it off her for a decent price, you can just, you can just pay me whatever. Right? I would love that. You, you got everything going here. So I mean, your guitars go for like 20, 30 grand? Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a good number, right? Yeah. OK. Abs I wouldn't sell for anything less. Thanks, man. You You're amazing. It. Thank you. I love that. Thank Great you so to meet much. You. Great and to meet you, too. Um, so I think I got a perfect solution for this. I'll give you 20 grand. The kids at the hospital get the money. And I'll end up making a deal with him. I won't make no money off him. And uh, everybody's happy. 
You got yourself a deal. That sounds great. Sweet. Go right over there, luggage paid. OK, thank you. I'm super stoked that I'm able to get way more than anticipated for the Children's Hospital and that the item gets to go back to DJ. That was like a cool life moment for me. There is one coin that is considered the holy grail of coin collecting, the 1933 Double Eagle $20 gold piece. And it was auctioned off in 2021 for almost $19 million. The Double Eagle has just become available on the market. I'm about to see the most expensive coin in the world. Kind of nervous. <laughs> Ian. Hi. Very nice to meet you. So that's it, huh? This is it. Would you like to see it? I would love to see it. Okay. Oh. Probably a little light didn't shine out when you open the bag. It did. It did. <laughs> wow. It's just incredible. It's the holy grail. The most valuable coin in the world. That's amazing. We have a 1933 double eagle $20 gold piece. Some people still consider it the most beautiful coin ever. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt thought all of our coins were ugly. He had a point. He wanted the best. He wanted yeah. the best design of a coin. Okay. And, and there was a, there was a, an artist. Augustus St. Gaudens. In 1907, he uh, designed, literally considered one of the most beautiful coins ever made. It's funny that one Roosevelt had this coin designed, and the other Roosevelt had it taken out of circulation. 1933, FDR becomes president. You know, we're in the Depression. Franklin Roosevelt, he created the Gold Confiscation Act. And basically, with a stroke of a pen, he made it illegal to own large amounts of gold. Um, said that everyone's got to turn their gold in at the bank and take those gold coins and get paper money. But the Mint did make some of these in 33, but they never issued them. They were supposed to melt them all down, but there were some shady deals done, obviously, at the Mint. A few of them got out in circulation, and originally, if you possessed one of these things, you were going to go to jail because the government said they were all stolen. Yes, the government has taken possession of every coin that's ever come out. This is the only one that they've legalized to okay. be owned. A lot of the times, you know, it's not only rarity. A lot of the times, it's the story. The story. I mean, and it's got this crazy James Bond international intrigue. Yes. So what's the exact story with this coin? Uh, in the 1940s, uh, King Farouk of Egypt was the biggest coin collector in the world and purchased the coin in the United States, applied for an export license. And mainly because of that export license is the reason why there's this one coin that's, that's legal okay. to own. This was one of the coins, but he had exported to Egypt, but it just disappeared for 40 odd years. And it surfaces. It surfaces in the 1990s, then came to the US. As soon as it arrived in America, there was a sting operation by the FBI, and two coin dealers were arrested for being involved in it, trying to sell the coin. And then for many years, there was legal action. And the end result was that the coin was legal to be sold and to be legally owned. It was then auctioned in June 2021 and sold for almost $19 million. And now it's up for sale again, correct? It's up for sale again. So you represent the owner, and the owner would like to sell it? Correct, yes. And how much does he want for it? Uh, we're looking for offers over $30 million. OK. Um, all right. Um, I do have a client who's interested. Um, so I need to give him a call. And I, and I also want, you know, Jeff Garrett. Yes. It's a lot of money, and I want him to look at it. Sure. OK. So give me a few minutes, get some phone calls, uh, and I will be right back. Okay. Great. So this is the coin. Wow. That's stunning. And we yeah. have to verify that the Secret Service and the FBI is not going to be rushing in here any minute now. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful, original 1933 Double Eagle. But the most important thing about this coin is the best story of any coin. It, it's it's the, the most famous coin. There are literally books written about just this one coin. It was against the law to even be in possession of one of these. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize it, but um, and the coins were never officially released. They made almost a half a million of them, 450,000, I think. And they were all melted, but a few of them got out. And then in 1944, when they uh, confiscated them from the five or six people who had the coins, then they really became forbidden fruit because they were illegal to own. It's this coin the only legal one to own. And you know, for generations, no one even thought the coin existed. So what do you think? OK, yeah, let me take a closer look. 
Bitcoin is, you know, fabulous. Um, it's uh, also in amazing condition. It's uh, MS65, which is gem condition. You know, just basically the way it was made with a few little bag marks. You know, authenticity is off the table. It's definitely for sure real. It's the greatest coin there is. Okay. And he's asking $30 million, which the price is what someone is willing to pay. Well, one of the biggest things that's changed in the last 10 years is how many billionaires and multi-billionaires have started collecting coins. At least one of the collectors, his goal is to have a complete set of US coins. And for anybody who wants a complete set of US coins, they have to have that coin. <laughs> you know, the thing about this coin, uh, when, when you have the only one, you can name your price and uh, no one's gonna undersell you So because there's nobody else got one. <laughs> you got a point there. <laughs> that's right, it's uniqueness makes it very special. All right, thanks, Jeff. It was a privilege. Love to seeing it. Good luck, Ian. Oh, da, 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 da. Well, um, you know, Jeff said he knew billionaire coin collectors, and I do. Maybe they're the same people, but uh, I just got the one. And um, he's willing to do $25 million. That includes my small commission, and that's what he's offering. Look, the coin market has increased so much. There's so many new collectors. It is the ultimate trophy, and look, it's a nice offer. I will say, like, any time there's an eight-figure offer on a coin, it's a nice offer. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't, I can't get it done at that. It needs to be over $30 million. All right, thank you so much for you letting me take a look at it. You're um, welcome. Pretty impressive. OK, yeah. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, there you go. Uh, put it away. See, not my hands. You have it. Thank you. And, um, thank you. All the luck of the world with it. Great, thanks. Okay. Thanks for looking at it. Have a good one. Cheers. Look, it's a unique item, and I am flexible to a degree, but uh, I do believe that it, it needs to be over $30 million. What do we got here? I have a Stradivarius violin dated 1763. A Stradivarius? Stradivarius violin. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> I bought a new house a couple months ago, and there's an old cedar chest, and I was going through it. There was a violin at the bottom of it. I pulled it out and took a look at it, and my heart just started beating. I thought I found a real Stradivarius fiddle and going to make millions of dollars off of it. So where'd you get this at? Actually, in a house that I bought. It was way at the back of the barn. An old cedar chest had a bunch of old quilts on top of it. You know nothing about it? There was no paperwork in the box or anything? No. Actually, his name was Stradivaria. It wasn't Stradivarius. Stradivaria. Oh, OK. <laughs> he Latinized his name. It was really common back then, like Christopher Columbus. Yeah. His real name was Christopher Colombo. Ah. But after he became important, he made it Latin sounding, so the us on the end of it. Learn something new every day, <laughs> don't you? Antonio Stradivari was an instrument maker back in the early 1700s. His instruments were considered the best ever made. Many people would argue that even today, the sound quality and the precision cannot be matched. That's why they go for millions of dollars. You're either the luckiest man alive, or I don't know what you are. Well, if it was a real Stradivarius, it would be worth millions. Yeah, you got a better chance of hitting the lottery, though, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Antonio Stradivari made over a 1,000 violins in his lifetime. So is it possible one ended up in this guy's attic? Anything is possible, but it's extremely unlikely. It is old. I don't think it's a Stradivarius. Every Stradivarius has been accounted for. The date's completely wrong. Stradivarius died long before 1763. Yeah, but his kids carried on. They made some more. I'm 99% sure that this is a copy. But some copies were so well made, they're still worth a lot of money. Not millions, but thousands. So what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. And how much did you want for it? Well, if it's a real one, if I can get a million for it. <laughs> I do have a buddy. Um, I can call him in. He can take a look at it. There could be something here. All right. And when he confirms it's a Stradivarius, I want my million dollars. Well, if it's a real Stradivarius, I'd give you a million dollars a minute. Let me get him in here. He can take a look at it, and maybe we can figure it out. I don't know much about Stradivarius violins or any violins, period, but I'm not leaving here till they call in an expert, because I have a gut feeling that this is one. I'm a violin maker, and I've been doing it for over 20 years. If you find a real Stradivari in an attic, it's a miracle. Antonio Stradivari gave us the modern violin, essentially. He improved upon the sound. He gave the instrument more power. He wanted a violin that could project over a Baroque-sized orchestra. One of the first things I like to look at 
is the style of the violin making. The back is curly maple of a medium curl. The top is medium wide grain spruce. So the wood is what Stradivari would have used. But it's also what any violin maker would use. OK. <laughs> so that doesn't prove anything, pro or con. So there's a chance. Maybe. What I'm going to do next is get a little feel of the style of the instrument inside. See if I can see any interior construction. Well, this is really interesting. I think I might have found something. I see that it does have a base bar that's a separate piece of wood from the top. So that's good. Man, you're killing me. <laughs> the uh, blocks are spruce, which would not be typical of Stradivari. Willow would be more likely. My conclusion is that this violin is a copy of a Stradivari, and it was made around 1920 in either Germany or Czechoslovakia. Meaning? It's not a million dollar violin. Mm. You went from a million dollars to nothing. To nothing. <laughs> Sometimes these violins can make good student instruments. They can sell in the price range of $1,500 to $2,500. In this condition, not anywhere near that. So what's the value in the condition it's in? No more than $500. Thanks, ma'am. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for all your help. They made thousands of copies of Stradivari violins. Just because something has a label doesn't mean it's real. So how much are you gonna give me for it? Nothing. Nothing? For me to buy it off you, fix it up, and try and resell it, 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 it's just not gonna happen. It's a losing proposition all the way down the line. Thanks for bringing it in, though, man. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm disappointed. I could have sworn this thing was going to be a, a real Stradivari violin. That's what I was hoping for, and it turned out it didn't, but it is what it is. What do we got here? 1886 Winchester rifle. Looks like a Daisy Red Rider, don't it? Yeah, but it can do a lot more damage. It's a spent shell casing, and that's why we always check to see if they're loaded. <laughs> pawn shop today to try to sell my 1886 Winchester rifle. My father-in-law used to threaten me with it when I started dating his daughter, and now since we've been married for so many years, he actually gave it to me, and I told him the first thing I was going to do is sell it. Do you know much about it, or? All I know is that it was uh, made in 1886. Okay. Dates right there. Okay, actually, that's the model, is oh. 1886. Winchester just did that. If they came out with that design in 1886, they called it a model 1886. They also made an 1873, they made an 1894, they made an 1892. I love Winchester rifles. They were repeating rifles, and they made a huge difference in battle. That's why they were called the gun that won the West. Basically, this wasn't a muzzle loader where you had to put a ball, your powder in, your ball in, pack everything down. This thing right here, you loaded right around, I imagine this took right around 10 rounds. You'd load them right in here, and 10 times in a row you can do this. It would fire every time. And this thing is a 4590 Winchester centerfire. The diameter of the bullet is a 45 caliber with 90 grains of black powder behind it. And it packs a hell of a punch. And that's a lot of pressure on the barrel. This is one of the first rifles that could handle a load like that. This gun was ahead of its time. Just everything about it was just unbelievable. This is a classic American rifle. There's no way to describe how Winchester feels in your hands. Do I want this gun? Yes. Do you want a pawn or to sell it? I want to sell it. I mean, it's a nice gun. I mean, in perfect shape, it's worth 10 grand. But this is not in perfect shape. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few problems with it. Someone marred up this right here. Let me see all the hammer marks right there. Yeah. Where the magazine attaches to the barrel, it's dovetailed. Oh, okay. Okay. And at one time, it slid out, and someone tried to beat it back in with a hammer. I mean, it, it takes away from the value, but not completely. How much do you think it's worth? To be honest with you, I think I can probably get $2,500. Um, if I'm real lucky, three grand. I, I would give you $1,500 for it. 
Okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Fifteen hundred is great. I thought it was only worth a couple hundred bucks. Okay, I'll give you a couple hundred dollars for it. No, it's okay. <laughs> All right, let's go do some paperwork. I've always wanted to shoot a Winchester 4590. This gun is the real deal. Now all I have to do is test it. What'd you bring me today? 1886, 4590. 4590, big guy, the big gun. Very nice. Let me take a look at this bad boy. Hi, I'm Tony, and I'm the armorer here at the gun store, and uh, I'm the old gun guy. Anybody who comes in here that's old and unusual, they drag me out of the back room, and uh, we talk about it. All right, 1886, it was uh, John Browning's first high-pressure design. The Winchester is uh, designed by John Moses Browning, probably the most prolific gun designer in, in the world. Designed over 120 patents. The guy was uh, literally a genius. This was his first design with the for the high pressure rounds, for the high big velocity rounds. Earlier ones he was basically with pistol calibers. This gun could take down anything in North America. Let's go shoot this thing. If I can, I like to test every gun I sell. But to be honest, I'm shooting this one for fun. This is a mean gun. You hang on to this, man. It's really going to give you a thump. Hold it tight. Have at it, OK? Let me show you how it's done. Hey. <laughs> yeah. See, your dad knows how to shoot a gun. Let's well, see how you did. Let's bring it back. Yeah. Hey, all right. Nice, nice shot. shot. Good gun. <laughs> see, that's how you do it, boys. Hey, how's it going? How you doing, sir? Good. What do we got here? I got something with George Washington face on it. And all I can really tell you from George Washington, the man had wooden teeth. <laughs> um, it's definitely something. Um, it's the wrong color for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> I have a George Washington coin. I'm here to get information on it and see if I can possibly sell it. My grandfather used to go to a lot of estate sales. This is one of the things that came from it. I'm not really sure if it's worth anything or not. I would like to get 5,000 for my George Washington coin. This is cool. Um, at first glance, I can tell it's not a coin. It's some kind of metal. You know, technically a coin has a denomination on it, and this doesn't have a denomination on it. Um, George Washington, 1797. 1797 was last year's president. Yeah. Uh, whoa. Got some serious secret scroll stuff on the back of it. <laughs> um, this is some kind of Masonic something. So you know much about the Masons? Yeah, I just know they have a secret handshake. <laughs> it was a secret fraternal organization that had all these rites and rituals and all this weird stuff. Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason, George Washington was, just about all the founding fathers. And the Great Seal of the United States has Freemason stuff on it. If you never knew that. Dollar. Here's a dollar. So like, you see the eye right there? OK. There's an eye right there. I mean, this thing has like all their little weird stuff on there. Look, the all-seeing eye, the square and compass, and a bunch of other symbols that I haven't even seen before. I'm really, really intrigued by it. I mean, there's something really weird going on right here. I mean, you know, you might be able to code this and find a treasure. <laughs> what are you looking to do with it? I was looking to sell it. OK. How much do you want for it? I'm looking for 5000 Perfectly honest, I don't know if it's worth 5 bucks or 50000 Um, If you don't mind hanging out, I'll get a buddy down here. He'll look at it, and um, maybe he can decode this thing. That sounds good. As far as joining the Masons, I would never join a club that would have me as a member. Dave, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, Rick? How are hey, you? Um, how are you doing? Good. This young man has something really intriguing. Hmm. If it's real, it's a fantastic item. You know, when we first had it down, I just thought it was some kind of metal or something. But you look at the back, there's all these Masonic symbols all over the back. Am I going to get killed for having this coin? <laughs> yeah, you might. That's an exceedingly rare item. That is a George Washington Masonic medal. It is literally the first Masonic medal, what they call Masonic pennies. And this is a phenomenon that grew tremendously over the years, over the centuries. And literally, there are more than 10,000 different types of Masonic pennies. This is like the one that started everything. There aren't more than about 20 of these known. It's exciting to see it. I mean, where did they come from? They were struck in 1797. 
by a silversmith and an engraver named Peter Getz. And he belonged to the Pennsylvania Lodge of the Masons. And he knew George Washington. They're right from the absolute crucible of early American politics and religion and society. And that's why collectors just absolutely love these things. If you don't mind, I want to take a closer look here. OK, this is genuine. It's marvelous. Cool, so I got 5,000 reasons to be happy? This thing is worth a lot more than that. Uh, that's now, you, now you're talking my language. <laughs> yes, the <laughs> universal language. So what do you think it's worth? Well, these things have become a lot more popular over the last decade. Collectors really love anything Washington, and these are so rare. This piece right now, I think, certainly is going to be worth about $40,000, maybe a touch more. Hey, now <laughs> we're talking. Yes, it's a big number. Well, thanks, man. Um, I'll let you know if I get it. OK. Congratulations. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right, so um, you still want five grand? No. <laughs> Um, I give you 20 grand for it. It's kind of a low ball number from what the... I mean, it, it's like this. I mean, I'm going to have to put it in an auction. I'm not going to get paid until next year. My money's tied up for a year. Um, would I take like 21? Nah. I'd, I'd, I'd go like 23. Nah, I'd probably take my show on the road, because they say good things come to those who wait. OK. Um, we change your mind, come back and see me. You never know. No worries. Have a good one. No problem. I might not have a Masonic medal, but I do have some mason jars. <laughs> Classic car I think you'd be interested in. You want to bring around back? Sure. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll meet you back there. All right, we'll see you then. Come on, Pops. All right. I need another car. <laughs> if it's one thing we love here at the shop, it's classic cars. The only problem is the old man always wants to take them home. You got to be kidding me. Nice. Oh, man, this thing looks amazing. It's a 1949 Hudson Commodore 8. Hey, Pops. What? You know what the amazing thing is about this car? What? You're still older than this car. <laughs> OK, son. I came to the pawn shop today to sell my 1949 Hudson Commodore. I bought the car three years ago. Ideally, it would be nice to get 35000 because I've moved, and I'd like the money, so. That's really, really cool. The Commodore was their big luxury car. Yes. What they really advertised was how big this car was inside. It was bigger than anything Chrysler made, Chevy made. Literally, you could, like, camp in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Hudson was a big manufacturer, son. They were super big in the NASCAR industry, but their Hornet was faster than hell. They had a lot of innovative ideas. Yeah, they had one of the very first automatic transmissions. Yes. I, I fell in love with this body style. I just love the low profile in the windows. And, yeah, and I've always that. loved cars like this, yes, too. It's... You know, fat and low. <laughs> <laughs> After World War II, the US went consumer crazy. Everyone wanted a big new car, and the Hudson Commodore was about the biggest thing out there. I mean, this thing is a beast. That's a two-body trunk, son. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looks really straight. I mean, right in here is usually where you find rust. This is where it, like, just collects. Mm hmm Yeah, it's, I think it's in really good shape. Still got the original hubcaps. That's rare. Yes. This thing is all original, uh, except for a few components in the uh, engine area. OK. Really. Now, that's some technology right there. <laughs> oh, straight eight. So what's this thing put out? like? 98 horsepower or something think, like that? I think it's 125 or something like okay. that. OK. Oh, yeah. This Hudson's pure class. This is from the day when a car was a piece of art, not some plastic pile of junk. I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed with it. I mean, it looks in great shape. Uh, how much are you looking to get out of it? Uh, uh, 35000 Ouch. Dollars? Yes. No. Um, tell you the truth, I don't know if that's a good price or not. Um, I've never had a 1949 Hudson. So <laughs> they sell at auction for I've seen recently 57,000, et cetera. So, you know, I, I deal in a lot of cars, but um, car market is weird. I mean, it, it's easy to get burned. Yeah. 
Do you mind if I have someone come down here and take a look at it? That would um, be absolutely fine. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. I love everything about this car, but there might be just that one little thing I don't know about, and I'm on the hook for a ton of money. These were really ahead of their time back in 49. Very well-manufactured cars. They came out of the box, they could break 90 miles an hour. I know it doesn't sound like a big difference, but the fact that this big boat could bust 90 miles an hour, that was, that was a big deal back then. Companies like Hudson were really throwing into the mix aerodynamics, making the car slicker, better performance, lower center of gravity, handled better. Nice car. Good Lord, there's a lot of room in this thing. <laughs> this is huge. Man, it's beautiful in here. You could easily sit four, four people across on this couch. And it's luxury, man. I mean, this is just beautiful in here. What do you think about it, boss? It's a boat. It you is. You know, I like boats. You just wished it was black, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take it for a drive? Absolutely. Nice. I, I I'd love to just feel this thing going down the road. Do it. It's a sweet ride. Beautiful. Beautiful. Looking forward to it. Let's go. Let's do this. God, I love how clean this car is. I like how smooth it drives, too, man. It does drive really nice. Clutch feels good. Tranny feels good. How you doing back there, sir? I'm doing fine. All right, all right. You could, you, you, don't, you don't mind being chauffeured around in this, huh? Yeah, well, I got to get you a hat. <laughs> I love it. This is the same car as Driving Miss Daisy, right? Really? Yeah. I, I think so, yeah. I yeah, it, it was. That's yeah, great. We're driving Mr. Daisy. <laughs> Where to, Mr. Daisy? <laughs> Home, James. <laughs> yes, sir. I think the car is very sellable. Uh, there is definitely a cult following for this car, and this one is really in nice shape, so I don't think he would have any problems flipping this if he can get it. So what do you think it's worth? Um, I think in her present condition, which, which I would say is really, really nice, she has a few little minor cosmetic issues. I don't think they're a big deal. I would safely put this car at a solid 25 grand. But my opinion, I'm I was at. thinking around 35,000. So we're, we're not that far apart. I, I'm, that's where I'm at, brother. All right, well, thanks, man. Absolutely, man. Now that we've heard what Danny has to say, I'm ready to make an offer on this thing. Hudson's don't come around a lot, especially in this great condition. Now, how much do you want for this thing? Well, I guess I'm thinking 25. <laughs> Can I give you 20 grand for it? You got a deal. All right, 20 grand. Should have said 18, Rick. You got to be kidding me. I bought the car for 10,500. We settled on 20,000, and I'm absolutely happy with that. Hey, what do we got here? A uh, beer barrel and an alcohol meter. So this is like the original breathalyzer. I got the beer barrel and alcohol meter from my grandfather after he passed. I know it was old and worth something, so I just held on to it for a while. I'm looking to get about $2,000. The lowest I'll take, close to about $1,400. Harvard Brewing Company? This is pretty neat. This is, this is an early case. This is probably right around 1900, I guess. Harvard Brewing Company was right outside of Boston, I think it was. Lowell Mass, right here. Right. And the most hideous thing our government ever did was prohibition, OK? When they tried to take all the fun out, out of life. At life in general, yes. And they banned alcohol in the United States. So Harvard Brewing Company decided they're going to make near beer. But no one wanted near beer. And they ran into some serious economic times, so they came up with this brilliant idea. Let's make beer and just call it near beer. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get away with it, it would, it would work out very well. And they got away with it for a while, and then until the feds showed up at their brewery. Government took the brewery. But this is the crazy thing. The government continued to make beer, and it eventually went broke. And uh, before everything went to hell, this is how they transported beer. So this is some weird apparatus to measure alcohol in beer, wine, whiskey, or something like that. If you know how to use it, I'm sure it still probably works, but I have no idea how to use it. I don't know as much about these items as I should, but being a really big fan of beer and history, I should learn a little bit more about them. This is some neat stuff. So how much you want for it? I was looking to get about 2,000 for it. Oh, I have no idea what a Harvard beer company barrels worth, but it's got a great story with it. I'll give you a grand. 
can do a little bit better than that. I, I give you 1200 bucks, maybe. This thing right here is cool, but it takes up a lot of space. I mean, what will we take? You do 14? <sighs> you know what? 1400 bucks, I think I'd make money. Yeah. All right, that'll work. Thanks. I'll meet you right up there. We'll do some paperwork. All right. I'm really excited about this beer barrel and this alcohol tester. I absolutely love the history of beer. And I have a friend down in San Diego who is a brewmaster, so he's gonna know what these things are worth. And maybe I can sell them to him and make a little money, because we know I love doing that. <laughs> hey, Rick. Hey, man. Good to see you again. Me too. So I, I got two really cool items. I have this 1800s scientific instrument for measuring alcohol, and I have no idea how it works or really what, even what it's worth. Wow. Well, look, let me take a look here. All right, so we got a heating element here. Yeah, here's the alcohol burner. And this goes that. That's as far as I got. OK. <laughs> and I believe this is going to fit in here. Right, so what we have here, it's an ebulliometer. It's based on the boiling temperature of different liquids. So we know ethyl alcohol boils at about 174, and we know water boils at 212. So they scaled that out, and the more alcohol, the lower the boil temperature. OK. I would love to fire it up. I'm just concerned about the mercury in this. It's, OK. It's, but there's nerds out there that love this kind of stuff. Um, I'm one of them. The field alcohol meter isn't something you see every day. From what I can tell, it's never been used. It looks in pristine condition. And I imagine that it would dictate the dollar amount at the higher end of the spectrum. See, he's young. And... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the Harvard Brewing Company. I mean, it's the thickest barrel I've ever seen. You know, back in the old days, these things found their way onto ships. They were being on railroads, so uh, they were hardy. They would reuse these over and over again as well. That's what the bunghole's about. You could fill and refill, clean these. You got your keystone here. You put the tap right on there. This would obviously be on its side. And you'd dispense beer right out of here. Now, if they did get in trouble in Prohibition, and a lot of these were destroyed, so that would help the value with this. So what are these things worth? Well, your vintage field meter here, I've seen ones that are in beat-up condition that are six, seven hundred bucks. This is pristine. I'm not sure it was ever even used. It's a nice piece of equipment. The barrel, it comes down to pre-prohibition or post-prohibition. Based on the shape, the thickness of the wood, the way the rings are, I'm betting it's pre-prohibition. So I'm going to say together here, about 2,000 bucks. So what did you pay? I paid 1,400. Huh? You know what? And they're going to look great in my bar. They are cool. Now, what's interesting is barrel aging strong beer in bourbon barrels, rye barrels, tequila barrels became fashionable. And I can show you how we use those today back in the brewery. OK, this I got to see. So how many barrels do you got right now? We're pushing about 800 of these barrels. It's beer that's finished and ready for market, but we take a portion of each batch, and we can park them in here up to a year. And they're going to be everything the original beer is, but now you're adding layers of complexity, like vanilla, oak, some bourbon notes. OK, cool. I love beer, but uh, <laughs> you can leave no, it. it's also got a great history. It's what people sustained on, because yeah. you know, if you were in London back in, say, the 1600s, you would be insane to drink the water there. The beer was fine. Mm -hmm. And it goes even deeper. You know, We stopped being nomadic for the grain, for beer making, bread making. Why did Mayflower pull over on Plymouth Rock? They ran out of beer. So <laughs> I would have paid a lot more attention in school if I'd known that beer touches lots of different elements of civilization. OK. So I got a great idea. I don't know if you're up for this, but uh, how would you like to brew a batch of beer? Oh, I'd love to. I think I can make that happen. It'd be Rick's Wicked Ale? You call it what you want. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go talk to my brewers. OK. Most people don't realize what beer has done for society. Beer was so important, the pharaohs in Egypt demanded beer in tax. The Romans had beer. All through the Middle Ages, they had beer. As a matter of fact, we had a revolutionary war because guys sat around in taverns and came up with the entire plan. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. How can I help you? Hi there. I have something really special I think you might be interested in. What is it? It's an ancient Roman bronze artifact from a chariot. Oh, wow. And you can see the nice design of it, the woman's face, and there's a circular hub behind it. So it attached on a chariot. So is the chariot outside? Or did you ride it in? <laughs> well, it's double parked. 
I'm at the pawn shop today to try to sell my ancient Roman bronze figurehead. I got this from an ancient artifact dealer at a coin show. I think this item is really valuable and very rare. How many items are there out there from old Roman chariot? I'm hoping to get $2,800 for my ancient Roman bronze figurehead. This is pretty cool, man. Chariot racing was the most popular sport in the Roman times. They would usually do seven laps, but the goal was to make the chariot behind you crash. So you wanted to kind of be the last chariot standing. And it was a really dangerous kind of violent sport, but it was actually one of the least violent sports in you know the gladiator sports games. It's a little bit out of the scope of what I know, but it looks to be pretty old from the Roman times. So what makes you believe this came from a chariot? Well, when I got it from the dealer, he told me he thought it was a, a, a decorative wheel hub off of a chariot. I mean, it does look like it could have easily come off a chariot. Definitely looks really cool. Yeah, I would imagine this is some kind of goddess, but there's no way for me to know for sure. And how much are you looking to get for it? $2,800. OK, I don't know the price of it, but I do know that this stuff is highly collectible, and it does go for a lot of money. But they've been faking this stuff for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'd like to have someone come down and take a look at it. That would be great. I'd like to learn how rare it really is. All right, give me just a few minutes, and I'll get someone down here. Thanks. I feel very confident. I'm hoping the expert looks at it and tells me, yes, it's even more rare than I expect, and that the value is higher. Hey, Bob. Chum Lee, how you doing? I'm good. Hi. Hey there, I'm Bob. Um, this is what I called you about, Bob. Jim believes it is um, off a chariot. I'm not exactly sure if it is or if it isn't. Mind if I look at it? Please do. What we've got here is the Roman goddess Minerva, goddess of wisdom, goddess of art, goddess of warfare. And this hole was used to attach it to whatever it went on to. So there would have been an iron nail that would have gone in through there. If it was from a chariot, it adds to the interest and intrigue. Craftsmanship in the ancient Roman times was just beyond what you would ever believe. All the little details just adds to the beauty. So what do you think? So if this is, as I suspect, ancient Roman, it dates between about the first century AD to the third century AD, but there are so many good fakes. So I would like to make sure. So I'm gonna hit it with some x-rays, stand back. This is my favorite part. We're just gonna hit it with a little beam of x-ray, let's say right there. It's 78% copper, 12% lead. So they had some lead, they threw it in the pot. 6% zinc. So zinc actually makes it closer to a brass than a bronze. But I have no doubt it is ancient Roman. It's got all of the elements that make me think that. It's of the style that could be from a chariot, but my guess, it's probably from a piece of furniture. All right, well, what kind of value will you put on it? Obviously, the little break at the base hurts a little bit, but it's a very nice piece. I've got to put this about 1,500 bucks. OK, that's pretty good, I think. All right, well, thanks for coming in, Bob. You got it. Thank you. All right, well, what are you willing to sell for now that you've heard Bob? Well, it is a lot lower than I expected. I um, guess I would go for $1,300. Would you do 900 No, that's too low. How about uh, 1200 so 1200 is going to be a, uh, still just a little too high for me. I would be a buyer at $1,000 if you want to sell it. Can you go a little bit more? 1050 and we're done, yes? I'll tell you what, I'll go $1,025, but that's the absolute highest I can go. It's a deal. Thanks. All right. Meet me at the desk over here, and we'll write it up and get you paid. Well, I'm happy with the $1,025 I made, so now I'm going to hop in my chariot and head home.